introduce myself. Um, why don't you go ahead and, and introduce yourself? Okay. Well, welcome to the Profit webinar. And uh, I hope everybody's coping. Um, webinars still go on, so we're, we're glad of that much anyway. Um, this webinar is about uh, my new book called Owning Game Changing Subcategories, Uncommon Growth in the Digital Age. The book is, is about market disruption, growth strategies, and innovation. Um, it, it, it does two things that aren't really uh, available in most books in this, in this general topic area, generally in the business strategy growth area. First, it incorporates, incorporates the concepts and methods of branding. You know, if you look at most of the books in the area, um, you look in the index and, and branding is not even mentioned. But it, I think it's, it's pretty clear when you start looking at case studies that branding is really an important part of it. You have to identify what's important about the innovation and, and the new offering, and you have to have a mechanisms to communicate that internally and externally. It, branding is, is really critical to every success story I've seen. Second, the book incorporates digital. So it really uh, lays out how digital enables and, uh, and even drives new subcategory growth plot platforms. So, uh, uh, so I think that I, I'm very excited about the book. I think it, it does provide a different perspective and, uh, that, and one should be especially comfortable with those that are in strategic marketing. So what I'm gonna do is uh, talk about the, the four takeaways that I see coming out of the book. And, uh, and, and, and I think that'll give you a flavor for what, the, what is the marginal contribution of this book. And uh, before I do that, I wanna start with a story. Story is about Airbnb, which, which began in 2007. It was in early October, and uh, Joe Ches Chesky and, and uh, no, Brian Chesky and Joe Gribbins were sitting in their South of Market San Francisco apartment, three bedroom apartment, wondering how they were gonna pay the rent. They were unemployed designers. And they came up with the, the thought that, you know, there's a sold out designer conference coming up at the end of the month. All the hotels are booked and the hotels are extremely expensive. We got three air mattresses. We got an extra bedroom. We got a living room. We got a kitchen. Why don't we rent that space to people that, are, that, that want to come? So they sent some uh, emails out to some designer bloggers and they got three, uh, three customers that paid $80 a night for five nights. They made $1,200, they made their rent. And then they thought, why don't we find some other sold out conferences? And they got one in, 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 in Texas and Austin and they did the same thing or similar thing. And then they, uh, after that, they thought, well, why don't we broaden this? And uh, if you flash uh, a forward to about uh, uh, to close to now, you see that there are uh, 150 million guests. Uh, you see there's 6 million hosts and a business value that's somewhere around $35 billion. That's in 12 years, a dozen years. And, and that's an example of... Uh, of how a, a new subcategory was created and how it scaled quickly and how it created an amazing business value. Why was that so successful? Well, let's look at, at the host side of things and ask yourself, why did hosts find this attractive? And uh, why did, uh, you know, why were they, be, uh, it, why do they want to become a, 
a partner and, and continue on this hose? Well, one reason was that Airbnb did not have owner managers that were just trying to gain some extra income. They had entrepreneurial hosts. And they called them hosts because they, these people really wanted to satisfy their customers. They called them entrepreneurial because they were innovative, they were creative, they were willing to change in order to improve that uh, guest satisfaction. It was really an attitude, it was really a, a personality. Second, uh, hosts are attracted because of the support that Airbnb provides. They, they early on, right off out of the box, they provided presentation help, professional photographers to make your place look better. And then they got best innkeeper ideas, mentorship program, online community, annual conference. A lot of these were added by Chip Conley, a, a hospitality guru that was joined the company in 2013, six years after they started. Four years after that, they developed Airbnb experiences where you can take people on a, a hiking trip or take them to the Louvre and, or whatever. And um, so you can leverage the passions, the knowledge, the interests of the host so they can get extra money and provide a, a, an exceptionally superior experience for their guests. And there's a review of guests and hosts. So from the host point of view, if they really develop something of excellence and improve their, their offering, they have a way to communicate that to guests be, through these guest reviews. And also, if they're uh, worried about having a bad guest experience, they can filter and preview their guests before they offer them uh, accommodations. So with that in background, let's look at these four takeaways. The first one, the only way to grow. Well, with some rare exceptions, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's really true. The only way to grow is to own game-changing subcategories that are defined by new or markedly improved customer experience or brand relationships. The only way to grow. Owning game-changing subcategories defined by new or marketing improved customer experiences or brand relationships. My brand is better than your brand strategies, which we mostly rely on a lot, almost never create growth, almost never. And they're often not fun. You know, I, I st first stumbled upon this, this uh, what I believe is a truism, when I was working in Japan and uh, got a hold of 10 decades of Japanese beer data. And I observed only four times during that 30 years did you see a marketed, uh, market share uh, change and a spurt of, of growth. And all four could be explained by a new subcategory like Asahi Super Dry uh, and, and that seemed quite remarkable to me because there was a lot of my brand better and your brand dynamics. I looked at the computer industry. In the 60s, we had IBM in the seven drawers like RCA and GE. In the 70s, along came DEC, became the second largest selling computer with their mini computer. It wasn't one of the seven drawers doing my brand is better than your brand. It was, it was DEC creating a whole new subcategory. In the 80s, we had uh, Dell uh, built to order PCs that created its own subcategory. And uh, we had Apple with its user-friendly interface in the 1984 ad with a woman running down throwing a Schlitz hammer through a screen. And in the 2000s, we have Salesforce.com with the cloud software. We have Amazon Web Services with cloud services. And there was another dozen or so uh, similar incidents, Sun Computer and others, in the computer industry. Again, every time there was a spurt of growth, it was uh, accompanied by a new subcategory. 
in the automobile space, uh, Chrysler, amazing example. They introduced minivans in 1982, and they went 15 years with no competition. None, no competition until uh, uh, Toyota came out with uh, uh, their, their entree and Honda came out with Odyssey. No competition. They sold 12 and a half uh, vehicles. They saved the company with no competition. Toyota Prius went 12 years with virtually no competition. Um, they came out in 2000, and 2000 their, their first uh, uh, second edition came out in 2003 and really took off. Enterprise rental car with its new subcategory really ran under the radar until they passed Hertz in the mid 90s. And now we have Tesla, of course, that has a new subcategory often in, in, uh, enabled a lot by the digital factors. And the car is so much a part of the digital world. So, you know, pick a category and, uh, you know, banks, clothing, yogurt, coffee, airlines, water, and, and take a look at it. Look at the category that you're involved with and look in the past 10 or 20 years and observe, you know, spurts of growth, spurts of growth that have some legs. And, uh, and I think you'll see that a subcategory explanation lies behind. Second takeaway. Um, a key element of a of a new subcategory is to have what I call must have benefits, attributes, or programs that create and define growth set subcategories. A must have is something about the the core customer base that's created are attracted by some benefits attribute pro programs that they must have. That means that they're uh, inhibited or even refuse to buy alternatives that lack these must-haves. Well, to, to take a, a look at the must-have phenomena, let's look at the, um, go back and look at uh, the uh, Airbnb case. And make some observations. First of all, there's multiple must-haves. It wasn't just one, there was four. In fact, there's seven or eight, I only put down four. In addition to that, there's uh, seven or eight for the guest must-haves as well. So there's uh, two sets of them from the Airbnb case. Almost never does a single must-have carry the day. You almost always see three or four are more likely six or seven or eight. Second, these must-haves uh, are not just functional. Um, they go beyond functionality. So for example, the entrepreneurial host is kind of an attitude. It's kind of a, a personality. It's, uh, it's, it, it's way beyond uh, just functionally what, what hosts do. And Airbnb experiences have um, uh, have a lot of emotion attached to it. You know that you know that uh, scene at uh, biking over the Golden Gate Bridge or whatever it may be. It's a lot of emotion, a lot of memory uh, attached to that. Third, it evolves. Now think back to 2007 when Joe and Brian were sitting in their living room wondering how they're gonna pay the rent. And they got a, uh, uh, a solution at, uh, to rent out space in their house. And compare that to what Airbnb is today. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, they had no envision that that was gonna to come to pass. There was no strategic plan saying that we're incrementally gonna do this. We're gonna hire Chip Conley in six years. We're gonna do experiences in, in 10 years. 
they they had no idea mentorship program. They had no idea this is going to happen, and and that's what happens in all these cases. That uh, these successful growth strategies, these successful subcategory platforms, they evolve over time. Their existing must-haves uh, evolve and uh, improve and get augmented, and new ones are added. Like the Airbnb experience was a brand new one, and um, and and finally, these things all really make a difference. They're not nice to haves; they're must haves. They really are meaningful. They really are something that uh, that uh, people value. The third takeaway. Um, the exemplar brand. There, there needs to be an exemplar brand developed, sometimes two, but uh, preferably one. And that brand should position the new subcategory, should scale it, and create barriers. And uh, so here's part of the uh, reason I said at the outset that uh, the book and the concepts of of owning game-changing subcategories, sort of uh, have as 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 their kind of unique contribution the perspective of of looking at of branding techniques and concepts and methods, and and one of them is to is to really identify and manage these must-haves, but but the other is the 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 role of the exemplar brand. The brand that represents the subcategory, the brand that then has the power to uh, to manage that subcategory, so that it wins. Well, let's look at job one: position the subcategory. What that means is to make the sub the must-haves prominent. So when you think of the subcategory, you think of these must-haves. They come to mind. They're they're um, you know, you, you don't, uh, uh, it, you know, they're not un, uh, under the, under the radar. They're, they're right out there. And that means that they'll, they'll, in doing so, they will affect the perceptions people have. They'll, they'll, uh, perceive the, uh, attitudes people have, and they'll perceive the, the use experience as well. So it changes everything and the positioning as in any uh, new offering or any existing offering for that matter is crucial. So let's, uh, let's look at Salesforce. When they uh, came on to the scene as one of the first application softwares that used the cloud. So they had to really establish the subcategory, cloud software. And some of the must-haves was there's nothing to buy and maintain, no investment. Another is you get continuous upgrades. And a third, which is a little bit defensive, but it is a secure option. And it's secure because of all the, uh, all the methods and technology that's put into the cloud service suppliers. And it's kind of cool. It's advanced. It's not obsolete. So it has that uh, personality of being sort of new and innovative and advanced and, and uh, so forth. So how do you communicate that? Well, one of the things that Salesforce did to increase uh, the visibility and the prominence of, of these must-haves was when Siebel had a, a conference, a major conference in San Francisco, um, uh, Salesforce picketed. They had signs saying software is obsolete. And of course, what they meant was software that's not uh, supported by the cloud is obsolete. And they had, they hired fake TV news reporters that uh, uh, interviewed these protesters. And they got enormous, enormous publicity from that. And they did some or other kinds of stunts to to elevate the uh, the uh, the existence of the cloud in people's minds and these must-haves. 
Second job for the exemplar is to scale. Scale, scale, it's, not, it's worth repeating. It's really important, especially today, when you uh, are attempting to develop a new subcategory, is to build it quickly. For one reason, you want to solidify the, uh, the customer base. You want to build a large customer base. For one thing, that creates buzz. And for another, it uh, creates a barrier to competitors. So if a competitor is considering trying to become relevant to this new subcategory and sees that you've already attracted those customers that are, have an affinity for this new subcategory, it makes the economics look uh, less attractive. And the second thing you want to build a customer base is you want to solidify your exemplar status. That's really a, a, a really important uh, role to play. And, uh, and if you get a, a, a customer base that's loyal to your exemplar brand and therefore the subcategory, it's going to be, uh, a, again, enable you to do a lot of things that you couldn't otherwise do it. Well, how do you do this? One way is over-invest in your, uh, your subcategory and its offering. You overinvest. Now, there's, I think in business school, you're taught two uh, pricing rules. You can use the skimming pricing route, where you price high at the beginning, try to recover your investment, and then as, the, uh, as the, you need to expand your market, then you reduce the price. That's not the strategy we want here. We want an overinvest. We want to underprice, like Uber, and that's how the uh, Uber became successful in Lyft. They underpriced. They were willing to lose money. Uh, and uh, Amazon, for for twenty years, has foregone profits by building infrastructure. Uh, they made in, uh, just jaw dropping investments, and everybody is along the line been skeptical of that. But the the uh, you see the result. They've got now 100 million members of Prime or whatever. I mean, they've got a customer base that really makes it difficult for people to do head-on-head -head com competition with them. And then use social media. Again, that's a, a whole new world that's made available by the computer. And, and let me talk a bit about the Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club um, started in... Uh, uh, 2012, just eight years ago, four years after they started, they were sold for a billion dollars to Unilever. How's that? Four years. And how did they do it? Well, one way they did it was through social media. They created a 90-second video that explained their must-haves, their operation, their offering, and, as, and their personality and their irreverence and so on. That, the video was extremely uh, funny, extremely irreverent, extremely energetic. It showcased the, the founder of Dollar Shave Club. And uh, it got, in two days, 48 hours, it got 12,000 people to become members. 12,000. And they jump-started the, the whole business. That video cost him $4,500. Of course, the founder was a comedy writer and a entertainer, so if you lack that resource, you might, it might have cost you 40 or 50,000. But still, they got uh, 12,000 members, and today that video has been seen by 26 and a half million people. Well, I'm not gonna show you the video because it has some offensive words that are, um, that are that people in their core target market find uh, intriguing but not everybody does so i'm going to show a follow-on video that um, that that really demonstrates their humor their relevance their uh, uh their personality and the, the their persona as being a feisty underdog and uh it's uh it's a little edgy as well it doesn't have the offensive uh, verbiage though. So uh, 
here it is. Hi, can you open the razor case, please? Photo ID. I'm just grabbing some razors. Grabbing? Put your index finger in there, sir, please. I just need to get in a case. Why do you need to get in the case so bad? So I can buy some razors. It's almost like they don't want you to buy their razors. Well, I want you to buy mine. DollarShaveClub.com delivers amazing razors for just a few bucks. Um, yeah, you could you could see that uh, the the uh, the nice thing about starting a new subcategory, especially if you're an outsider, you've got some permission to be the feisty art of dog, to be humorous, and so forth. And uh, being humor has has a lot of attributes. Um, Actually, I have a daughter that's writing a book on humor and business that'll be out in October that explains that in more detail. But uh, it 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 doesn't uh, it, you know you really can sort of understand that introducing humor as they did there, it really provides first of all a distraction from uh, counter arguing. It provides a um, a basis for liking and connecting, and it it provides a way to exhibit this uh, this personality, a brand personality, which is always an asset, and, and one of being the feisty underdog, the irreverent, and, and uh, so forth. Job three for the exemplar, build barriers. Now, if you create a, uh, a subcategory, and then some competitors come in and, and establish their relevance, it is uh, not that worthwhile. So we don't want to build barriers. It's classic economics. You build barriers. It's old Michael Porter stuff. You build barriers, and then you will have a more attractive market. We've already talked about two barriers. One is the strength of the must-haves you develop in the positioning uh, job one. That becomes a big barrier. The base of loyal customers that we talked about in scaling job two is a, is a barrier. But there are others, branded innovation, for example. Unique little branded, it's fabric innovations, heat tech, airism, and competitors who scramble to duplicate that fabric innovation don't have access to those brand names. Another technique is to have continuous innovation, be a moving target. That's what Prius did, that's what Chrysler did, that's what Tesla's doing that in the case of Prius and Chrysler, every two or three years, they came out with a new model with six or seven or major must-have innovations. The final takeaway, and that com that, here comes the digital aspect to this book. Digital has put subcategory creation on steroids because now there's more of them I mean, not just 10% more, 100% more. It's amazing. They grow faster. They're, they're better able to scale. And they have a higher upside. So uh, it used to be a, to put a subcategory in place took a long time. Not so much anymore. There's four reasons to that. First of all, comes the digital advances, the uh, Internet of Things that we have. Um, look at the internet users, for example. In 14 years, they went up four times. Smartphone users in 10 years went up nine times. I mean, just think of, of that kind of a market that has opened up. Look at GPS and voice recognition in the last 10 years and how much that's improved and what uh, opportunities that gives for somebody that wants to create subcategories. And then we have smart cars, we have smart factories, smart homes. We have Lexa. You know, six years ago, Lexa didn't exist. In this first uh, four years, they, they, they have 30 million of them installed in the US. So that changes uh, not only the, the Lexa subcategory, but everything that surrounds it and is connected to it. Second is e-commerce. It wasn't too long ago, a couple decades. If you had a new offering, a new idea, market disruption, you needed a personal sales force. 
or you needed to find a way into storefronts. Or you might even need to create your own set of storefronts. Can think of the cost. Think of the time. Now we have e-commerce. I mean, uh, uh, Airbnb was online in a matter of weeks. And look at how some of the air commerce uh, companies are, are doing. And here's four reasons how uh, new subcategories are leveraging e-commerce. We have the feisty underdog with humor at uh, Dollar Shave Club. We have the simplified force, it's choice. Dollar Shave, Shave Club, you got three choices. And uh, it's Amazon, you have 12,000 choices. Uh, most people would prefer three if they have confidence in those choosing. You'll have the low cost versus Gillette and drugstores. Uh, they can afford because of the economics of e-commerce to offer much cheaper. Uh, and then you have uh, the ability of an e-commerce company to, to become higher purpose. So Casper is a, a sleep company. It's not a mattress selling company. It's a sleep company. They have meditation. They have a sleep channel. They have all kinds of things to uh, help you sleep. And you got to believe that somebody that's interested in sleep is going to generate good mattresses. Digital communication has changed everything. So it wasn't too long ago. Again, a couple of, go back a couple of decades. If you had a, a disruptive innovation, a new subcategory, you'd have to develop an advertising campaign. You'd have to make media buys. And that could take nine months. It could cost tens of millions of dollars. Now, you got email and social media. Airbnb started with a small email campaign to uh, bloggers in the designer industry. We have social media. And so you could take this 90 second video as Dollar Shave Club did and create 12,000 uh, 12, subscribers and ultimately 26 million views. Lifebuoy in, in its Help a Child Reach 5 program uh, did a, a, a three-minute video on three villages that they put that hand-washing program into. They got 44 million views. 44 million, that's bar soap, that's social media potential. And it's all based on the share idea. You're sharing. And there's websites. So websites provide a way for somebody like REI to uh, capture not only their product line, but their values, their philosophy, and their programs. And it, it, it all comes together on the website. And the web, the people can be attracted by, by the products, but it can also be attracted by the other things, but it provides a way to, to really communicate in a way we couldn't ever do before. Finally, brand communities. A brand community is a group of people with a shared involvement or even passion in an activity, issue, or interest area with the exemplar brand and its website or social media as a focal point. So the idea is we, we come out with a, um, introducing a new subcategory. We have, we're gonna be created its exemplar brand. And incidentally, um, the exemplar brand, it doesn't have to be the pioneer in the category. It often is not the pioneer. I mean, Prius was not the first compact uh, hybrid. That Honda was out two years before them, but Prius was the first to get it right. And uh, most of Apple's innovations, uh, the iPad, the uh, iPhone, they weren't the first, but they were the first to get it right. But anyway, the uh, one of the app, the uh, the options for a exemplar brand is to create a brand community group of people with a shared involvement or even passion in an activity, interest, or interest area with an exemplar brand and its website as a focal point. 
Um, I think this is really a powerful concept and it's, it's very different um, than most people's concept of communication because it generates bonding, it generates uh, uh, a social benefit. Now we've had brand communities forever. The owners, Harley owners group, the hogs is, is one of the most famous. But it, Hog is a, or Harley is a, a charismatic brand, and these people are really super involved, and that's pretty rare. But even in the Hog community, now that they've gone in digital, they have so much a, more ability to operate that group effectively and with more involvement in death than ever before. But you look at uh, that uh, others, look at Sephora, for example. They have the beauty insider community, real people, real time, real talk, find beauty inspiration, ask questions, get recommendations from members like you. So you can make your profile and you can talk with people that, that also have greasy hair or also have dry skin or something, or also interested in, in lipsticks or have an opinion about a new product. Not doesn't have to be a Sephora product, any product. They have an enormous following. They have an enormous active user group each month. And look at Etsy. It, it's a, a place where people that are interested in, in making crafts uh, and it, people that are interested in owning crafts can come together and interact. So there's a there's an Etsy uh, craft makers community that uh, can interact about all kinds of craft issues. Some, some involving making them, some involving presenting them, some involving uh, selling them, pricing them. And uh, they come together and, and I mean, the level of involvement, the level of, uh, of social benefit, the, the connection, uh, you know, it just makes Etsy such a, uh, a and, and the subcategory it represents, such a dominant part of their lives. So, uh, as I said at the outset, I think one of the uh, aspects of this book that is different from all the other strategy books that came before, and there's a, a lot of really good ones, is that <laughs> this book uh, talks about the digital uh, enabling of new strategies and, uh, um, and new subcategories. And it's because of the digital advances, because of the e-commerce, digital communication, and brand communities. And the, uh, and the other thing that the book does is talk, uh, put a branding overlay on the on this whole category of of strategic growth and and the heart of that is the concept of an exemplar brand that is serves to position scale and create barriers for the subcategory and its exemplar brand and then the other two takeaways is the uh, fact that it's all based on must-haves you need to identify must-haves that are really must-haves not nice to have. And if to do that, you usually require either substantial or transformational innovation. So beware of incremental innovation that sounds good to you, but is not really a must have for customers. And look at benefits, look at attributes, look at programs. And then the, the finally, the initial one, the only way to grow. You know, my brand is better than your brand does not create growth. And um, you, you need to own game-changing subcategories defined by new or markedly improved customer experience or brand relationships. So it doesn't have to be new. It, it can be something that represents a market improvement over what's there now. But it's got to have a meaningful effect on customer experience or brand relationships. So thank you. It's been uh, really uh, uh, great to be with you. And um, 
I'm uh, I'm, I'm gonna uh, find some questions and uh, um, so if our system's working right, we should have a, a set of questions coming up. Um, okay. All right. I've uh, so uh, the first question is: uh, How is the pandemic affecting Airbnb? What is Airbnb doing about it? Well, I think the more general question is: How is the is the pandemic um, affecting any brand? And Airbnb is no exception. I think that the uh, the 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 first the first line response is to uh, I mean in, in any crisis, my advice is the first line response is try to do something about the problem. So uh, you, we see airlines saying they're going to clean all the spaces before each flight, and uh, we see. Uh, uh, others talking about how they're going to uh, move to online to provide the same service online. So uh, that's something. But the second thing I always advise is to uh, try to change the subject and to try to create a second line of questions that uh, uh, that that sort of removes the obsession with this problem from your brand. Now the pandemic is not your common ordinary brand problem of course and so uh, uh, these things uh, are are gonna you know probably have to be augmented as far as uh, Airbnb I so the answer to the Airbnb question is I don't really know but my guess is that they're doing uh, a whole bunch of things to sort of sanitize the experience and they're probably uh, putting uh, some of their, a lot of their activity on hold, certainly on hold where people are, are sheltered down. And uh, so it's going to be a, a certainly a, a, a business problem for them as it is for many others. How do you make a distinction between must-haves and nice-to-haves? Any examples? Well, the, uh, the, the core idea is loyalty. So if there's a must have, it should contribute to loyalty. That means it should inhibit a customer from going to other options. If it doesn't do that, then it's, it's not strong. And of course, there's gonna be a, a level of strength of a must have. It's not a zero one thing. Can the same brand have multiple offerings that act as exemplars in multiple subcategories? In other words, can only brands be exemplars? Can, can products? Any examples? That's a really, really good question. And that's a, a tough question when you're uh, creating any new offering, but especially a, a subcategory. And uh, the answer really depends upon the, the basics of, of, of uh, brand strategy portfolios. And, uh, and I wrote a book on that a long time ago. My daughter criticizes me for always saying I wrote a book on that. But uh, I, uh, uh, what you have to do is to look at your options. And in general, your options are to uh, use a completely different brand because you, you need to have a subcategory that's so unique and so distinctive, it needs its own brand. And any, any else will, will will deflect from its thing. Then you can use an endorsed brand. So you can, in, you, so, you know, uh, Procter & Branger brings you or, or Lifeboy brings you something. So it's an endorsed brand. So you have some credibility, but the brand has got a lot of independence. And then you can have a sub-brand. And then you have more of a connection if, it's, if there's no incompatibility at all. And, uh, and the sub-brand might give you enough leeway to give your story. And then sometimes the master brand is okay. 
And this is a, uh, an innovation within the mustard brand space that, uh, that will work. And it, a brand portfolio strategy, unlike brand equity management, is very messy. And it, there's, it's, there are very few rules to go by. And so you have to, uh, um, you, you have to really get involved in the business strategy, the consumer, the perceptions, and, and what it is. It's really idiosyncratic. Um, any insight or perspectives on implication this thinking has on culture and employee engagement? Um, I think that that there's um, the the idea of an exemplar brand and subcategories have uh, the, the similar uh, need to involve culture and in the employees in the whole project, but it's amplified in the area of subcategories because you've got something new, you've got something that has to scale fast, you've got something that is uh, is is unique. And, uh, and, and so forth. And so it's uh, more than important than ever to uh, make sure the culture and so on is, is uh, buying in to this whole concept that it's, that it's uh, uh, not only bought in, but it's really enthusiastic about it. It's really committed. It's got uh, um, it's energy and it's capable of, of creating energy. And if, uh, if everybody's not on the same page internally, it, there's gonna be a, a real problem. And that might mean that you have to adjust the culture. It might mean the existing culture is uh, it's not perfect, it's not as supportive as it should be, or it might be that it's even destructive. And so, that creates a whole lot of issues. Do you need a whole different organization with its own culture? Uh, remember when an IBM came out with the PC back in the 80s, uh, they couldn't do it within IBM organization. They just couldn't. They created a whole new organization down in Florida to, uh, to run that. Um, you mentioned the role of branding and identifying and communicating the value. How do you see the relationship of branding and product innovation? In what ways do, can brands go beyond my brand is better than your brand? Well, uh, the way is really to, um, to devote more of your resources to creating new game-changing subcategories um, at the margin and have a little bit less devoted to my brand as your, your brand stuff. So a little bit more on substantial and incremental innovation, uh, percentage-wise a little bit less on incremental innovation, which always seems safe, which is always um, owned by very powerful people in the organization because they're running the, biz, the big business units. Um, but branding is really central. Uh, and it starts with creating your brand vision or brand identity, the, what you want your brand to stand for. And that's recognizing what's, what are these must-haves? What are the priority must-haves? What are the most, what must-haves need to be the most visible because they're the easiest to comprehend and, and they give you the best, big, biggest bang for the buck. So you, you really have to know what you want to stand for. You have to set priorities within that space. And then second of all, you've got to figure how to, um, how to communicate those key must-haves. And, and that really involves two things. One, you have to uh, talk about real tangible substantive programs. And uh, uh, it, it, it might be a, a social program, might be environmental program, might be a an, an offering uh, enhancement. It might be a, uh, a brand community around using the product like salesforce.com as a brand community all about using their software. So it, it might be substantive. And uh, in that regard, you always want to be dynamic. You want to be improving your must-haves, maybe even adding new must-haves. So there's a, a substantive element to it, but there's also a communication element. How do you break through? How do you uh, 
get people to to hear you to uh to accept you and i my last book was creating signature stories and it talked at length about the role of stories in in performing that function but uh if if you want to position if you want to scale um if you want to provide those those jobs of the exemplar brand of building barriers too and it, it, you the branding concept from management to substance to communication is is really uh, really a key thing. Um, so I guess that's the uh, the questions that that popped up at least, and uh, that at least I've been able to see, and. Uh, uh, Anyway, it's been really uh, great to uh, to have you in the house, and uh, I uh, I really appreciate you you being here and participating, and uh, I hope that uh, the book helps you and your organization, and uh, uh, we look forward to doing this again. <laughs>